My name is Bill Pelleggi. I'm a nurse anesthetist at the Pittsburgh VA. And as a staff anesthetist there, our patient population are, are veterans. Uh, nationally, veterans are subject to about 20% PTSD. Of that same percent, about 20% of those patients are also subject to emergency delirium. And that would be a, a bad wake up or a violent, potentially violent wake up, uh, post-operative following an anesthetic. And also nationally in the civilian population, it's, uh, it's, it's about, oh, 5%. So the, the likelihood of uh, emergency delirium is, is much higher. It's five times higher in a, in a veteran population. Emergency delirium, um, the easy definition is, is in a, a, in a, a, an abrupt awakening from an anesthetic. It could be any anesthetic or for any procedure. Um, what the anesthesia does is um, there's a period as the medicine from the period of you being absolutely asleep and sedate to waking up. That's, it's, I call it a bridge. It's called stage two anesthesia. In that stage, when, you're, when your ears and your senses are emerging from that anesthetic, it is a period of confusion. It's a period where if there's involuntary movement, action, crying, uh, really any, any behavior that would be involuntary, that short bridge, stage two anesthesia, waking up, is also the most dangerous period. That's the period where, under the wrong circumstances, you are easily triggered by a sound or or uh, it could be a, it could be a voice. What we found and what's proven is that a female voice upon emergence is better, safer than a male voice. And, and the theory, at least on the military side, is that a female voice would potentially remove you from a combat experience because it's a female voice that would be potentially more calming, more soothing, and also not remotely attached to your combat experience. If that's the if that's the source of your PTSD. So our concentration as an anesthesia provider is emergency delirium. Emergency delirium is uh, usually, it, there's usually a triggering event. And so a triggering event could be a loud noise, a smell, a sound, uh, a, a, it's usually an abrupt noise. Um, but it, uh, in your reading, in reading of PTSD, it's, it's those people, combat veterans in particular, that would avoid July 4 celebrations. If they used to hunt, they don't hunt anymore. It's that loud, abrupt noise, which acts as a triggering event. Under anesthesia or emerging from anesthesia, um, the drugs that we use, they, they, suppress, they suppress you in a manner that you can't distinguish. Uh, you know, if it's a combat experience, uh, you, you can't, you're unable to distinguish what that noise source is. And so it may trigger a flashback or a, an episode of violence. Uh, Project Golden Eagle was actually started in 2012, so it's it's 10 or 11 years old. Um, initially, it was two PACU nurses at the Pittsburgh VA that uh, they clearly identified that the patients waking up that were most likely to be violent or confused also had a history of PTSD. So it was, it was brilliant for these two to to say how you know how do we screen and identify? So early on in that in 2012. They would pre-screen each patient's uh, each patient on the OR schedule for a history of of PTSD, traumatic brain injuries is related, uh, sexual assault, violence, things like that, or or a history of emergency delirium. And so those patients were screened like today for tomorrow's OR schedule. And it was just brilliant for them to say, we're going to give these people a quiet room in the pre-op area, and we're going to give them a yellow OR cap. So that everyone on uh, in the perioperative area knows that this patient, if nothing else, is is more likely to wake up poorly, bad, or with violence. Um, I just started there six years ago. Uh, I'm a veteran myself. Um, what I noticed uh, for myself, my 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 event was being in the recovery room and seeing an older gentleman screaming, "Get down! Get down!" He was clearly not in Pittsburgh. He was he was in Vietnam, and uh, and and screaming and swearing that I was going to be shot, and and so when I approached him, 
I thought, you know, I'll, I'll do a little hands-on. I'll calm him. I'll talk him out. And that was, that was definitely the wrong answer. It's just ineffective. So once I got within arm's reach, he threw me to the floor. And, uh, and when I got up, I, I knew right then that, you know, we have to do better. You know, it wasn't enough that we know who and identify or pre-screen who was going to have these episodes of violence. It was my mission uh, that day, getting off the floor that, you know, there's got to be a way to prevent this. And and that's where Project Golden Eagle uh, kind of became reborn. And uh, it was a matter of uh, me speaking to the, the right to an individual at the Pittsburgh VA in behavioral health. And then it took us about 14 months to formulate what's now known as Project Golden Eagle, taking it a further step to not only pre-screen and put patients in a quiet area, but do a better pre-operative assessment for, you know, what are their triggers? What, are, what is their history of PTSD? And, uh, and what we found and what we know is that PTSD of any form, whether it's uh, a, a childhood event, a sexual assault, it, it doesn't have to be combat. It, it, it just has to be a uh, an, an event in a person's life, and at the VA, of course, we see more combat and more those type you know military related stressors, um, because that's the environment we're in. But um, so what we do is we assess better, and then we plan better. And and what we found uh, myself and Amanda Beckstead, my anesthesia partner, uh, is that there's really just two drugs that make that situation worse. They, uh, the, the PTSD brain is now physically and chemically different by MRI, by, by scans, uh, someone with PTSD, their brain now functions differently, uh, when, when triggered or, or with an episode of anesthesia related emergency delirium. And so, so just a matter of good reading and research, you know, there's, there's two agents that make that situation worse. So we, our anesthesia management is to eliminate these two agents and go with the drugs that are proven or expected to perform better. And uh, since 2018, our, our injury rate has been zero. Um, we implemented summer, we implemented the anesthesia portion and the hands-on training for all the perioperative staff in 2018. And since then our injuries are zero. And uh, we really attribute that to a solid prevention strategy of doing a better assessment planning better, planning the medications better, and then following through with a, with a safer and smarter plan. When we look at the statistics and, and how these, uh, how they impact patient behavior upon um, emergence from an anesthetic, uh, on a civilian side, it's about 5%. Um, I, I practice, uh, I have 20 plus, well, 25 years practice in a civilian facility, and now these past six years uh, at the VA. And um, what I think the success of our program translating to uh, another civilian agency or, or a hospital is just a, a simple matter of asking a couple more questions on preoperative anesthesia assessment. Um, it, if if in any hospital a patient is asked if there's a history of violence in the home or domestic violence, uh, it, it's a simple yes no question, but that doesn't translate to an anesthesia plan. So what we do once the patient is pre screened for PTSD, then we we know that patient is subject to or may be subject to emergency delirium. And so what we've done is the the patients, the fifteen or twenty percent of patients that we see that are not or they're either not pre-screened for PTSD or sexual assault. Uh, so that puts us kind of in the same category as the civilian population, whereas these are patients who either don't have a history or a known history of emergency delirium, but may have a history of PTSD. And so taking Project Golden Eagle out of the Pittsburgh VA and, and trying to adopt it outside, it's, it's honestly just, it's just an assessment. You know, is there any history of PTSD of any cause or sleep disturbances? Um, I, I think the younger generation, younger meaning uh, not Vietnam veterans, uh, more Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, the last 20 or 25 years. I, I think that stigma of PTSD is gone, whereas it, it existed or it seems to exist stronger with the older veterans. 
Um, and so, so a, a question of PTSD or sleep disturbances seems to carry a conversation for a patient to, to either admit or think that, uh, you know, the last time I had surgery, you know, I was held on and, and that bothered me. And, and we have an incident, uh, Amanda took care of a patient. She, she was a uh, college age and, uh, she, she was putting off her surgery because she, she awoke in a period of emergency delirium, uh, at a civilian hospital. And, and as her behavior manifested into, you know, fear and violence, she was, she was locked in a state where she was reliving her sexual assault and, and without the training to identify, assess and plan for a patient like that, um, that OR staff did what they thought was best. They held her down, which only escalated her confusion and her state of violence. Um, so this program going outside of our facility um, is really, on, it's on that cusp, but we're on first base. Uh, we paired up with the Pennsylvania Safety Authority um, in 2021 and that organization assigned us a writer, Matt Taylor, a uh, research analyst. And so we looked at first the Pennsylvania civilian statistics of emergence delirium, going back through, uh, I think we started at 2000 incident reports, and then had to identify from that which of these were anesthesia related across the civilian Pennsylvania population. Got that down actually to 97 that were clear cut anesthesia related. Uh, that information, that study was published in December of 21. And then what we did was from that program or that study, we looked at just Project Golden Eagle to, to kind of plan for um, under, under the uh, Pennsylvania Safety Authority's direction was to make our program almost a how-to manual. So what we published in December of 22 is a a, it's a how-to manual. It's like the manual that came with your TV that nobody reads. Um, it's start to finish, how to identify, how to assess, how to plan. And, uh, and so there's the anesthesia side, that's 50% of it. And then the other 50% is how to train your staff. And, and that's, that's as important as the anesthesia. And it, it really is 50%. So on the planning side for the non-anesthesia, uh, we look at those assessment questions and the planning to train the staff to better react individually and as a team to safely restrain a patient and, you know, at the same time, protect themselves from injury. So uh, emergency delirium episode, um, we define it and we wrote uh, uh, that there's, there's, a, there's a clear line between violence and nonviolence or dangerous versus non-dangerous. So non-dangerous and non-violence, uh, what we define would be the patient is not a harm to themselves or a harm to the staff. That could include uh, inconsolable crying, uh, crying to the point of being hysterical crying. When a patient is in that state, they make eye contact, you know, but clearly they, they go to sleep in Pittsburgh, but clearly they wake up in Iraq or, or at the time or place or emotion of their, their episode or event that, you know, brings about this PTSD emergence delirium on the, on the nonviolent side, uh, we've had patients that are inconsolably crying. They'll pull the covers over their head. It, it's even though it's not violent, it's still a period of awakening in that stage two anesthesia where, you know, we, we speak, we say it's going to be okay, you know, maybe touch a patient, put your hand on your arm. But they're still in that zone of stage two where that doesn't always work. And so what we do is we have a medication called Presidex. So Presidex is, I like to call it a soft sedative. It's a soft sedative because uh, this drug puts you in, a, it really does sedate you to a place of tranquility. It, it's a calming drug but it takes five or 10 minutes to work. So in the, in the, in the episode of nonviolence, this is a drug that works great. It works great because it, it doesn't set up so fast 
but it sedates the patient to the point where they're still able to to answer you or they will be shortly it's it's uh, I, I think the analogy is you know everybody wants a smooth landing in the airplane but for for someone like this emerging from anesthesia we want that runway to be a little bit longer so we would use a drug like presidex as a preventative strategy towards the end of the procedure or, you know or surgery to lengthen that runway and land this plane a little more smoother on the opposite spectrum, I, where there's uh, an episode of, of violence, of self-harm or patient harm, I mean, it's thrashing, it's kicking, it's, it's pulling out IVs, it's pulling out breathing tubes. It really is, a, uh, it looks violent and it, it is violent and it's potentially dangerous to the patient uh, or to the staff if they're not trained to, to approach a patient correctly. Uh, the verbal de-escalation, I want to honestly say that that's out of the ballpark. It doesn't work. So in a period of violence where that preventative strategy is now useless, essentially. So we would use a stronger drug like propofol, which, which onsets very fast. So we like to teach that Presidex prevents a fight and pro propofol stops a fight. Despite our, despite our best assessment for PTSD and related behaviors, um, is is the potential for emergency delirium. Absolutely. So what we've done is we've expanded our assessment question. Uh, in 2012, Project Golden Eagle only looked for, screened, or asked about a history of PTSD in trauma or combat experience. And, and that really doesn't begin to um, open the umbrella of related risk factors. And so our questions are from, from one or two questions in 2012, since 2018, that's broadened out to about 10 questions. Some patients, they like to fill out the, it's a simple questionnaire. Uh, some patients like to fill it out and check the boxes. So what we look at is uh, domestic violence, uh, history of sexual assault, um, depression, anxiety, uh, alcohol, drug abuse, things, things that may point you in a direction that a patient is self-treating something that they're not identifying as PTSD. Uh, traumatic brain injury is, is on that same assessment scale. Um, really, it's, it's uh, any, any event can be perceived as, as a, a path or a trigger for someone, someone that is susceptible, um, trying to think of the word, uh, startle reflex, someone that startles easy. Uh, it, it, it may not be PTSD related, but an abrupt noise upon emergence, for whatever reason, could trigger these same behaviors. Because as the medicine wears off and as the patient awakens, it is truly a, a truly a bridge of involuntary action. We we just published in December twenty one with the Pennsylvania Safety Authority, uh, the the editorial direction that we received as a team and, and, and also with Matt you know, their research analyst and writer was because we're not research and we are QI and they are purely research and best practices. We fell somewhere in between. We had, we had a program that was coming on uh, several years old. Our injury rate was zero. We were seeing, we were seeing uh, bad wake ups, potentially violent behavior once or twice a week, you know, with, with real staff injuries in years 2000 uh, or prior to 2017. And, um, and so it was their editorial direction that they wanted something replicable. They wanted, they wanted our program. Uh, they wanted it as a word document. So, so what we published was the nuts and bolts of project Golden Eagle, the entire medication strategy, why these two drugs are bad and why these three drugs are, are great. And it, and with their hand, uh, it is best practices research based. And with our hand meeting in the middle is we came up with a generic form of Project Golden Eagle. It's, it's the entire preoperative assessment. It's the entire medication strategy. It's the entire um, lesson plan for the hands-on training to teach a staff member how to safely approach or restrain a, a, a patient, whether they're violent or nonviolent, you know, to protect themselves as well as protect the patient from, from more harm. And then what basically what that marriage produced was a, 
a 50 page document that anyone can download it's free um and you could put your name at the top of it you can put any name you want on it and and it's all plug and play i i, I didn't see it at the time but i just think that was brilliant on matt's behalf uh and the editorial staff of pennsylvania safety authority to make a how-to manual to replicate project one eagle The barrier to implementation is uh, really provider preference and experience and culture. Uh, I mean, I've been an SDS for 25 years, and and these these two drugs that that it's for said and a gas agent. Uh, I remember early in my training and and in the first 15 years of my practice when when I saw emergence delirium, I gave more of those drugs, and it just escalated. I just made it worse. You know, and and it's it's this cultural. Um, I don't know what's a stronger word than habit. Uh, it's this cultural attachment to giving what you were trained to do, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago. And, and knowing that it doesn't work, like you give a drug and you say, oh, that's a bad behavior. I'll give more of this drug. And then you <laughs> and then you're on this train. I'll give a little bit more. And the, and the behavior just escalates. And so what we're hoping to do as QI uh, is to penetrate that culture, to try something different, you know, to, to, to read a little, to try a little, and, and to, I guess, put your neck out a little bit to not use these two drugs, but use these two drugs. And I, I, I don't have a financial interest in, in any of this, but it's just a, a, a proven strategy to improve outcomes. And our, our biggest barrier is uh, is experience and culture. Asking a, an assessment question costs you nothing. Uh, it's a simple question. You know, any history of PTSD for any cause or, or sleep disturbances. And, and, and if it's a yes or a maybe, then you can ask about a history of uh, domestic violence or, or sexual assault or depression, anxiety, these related risk factors that would make you believe that this patient would benefit from Project One Eagle. Um, and so, so on the front, uh, it's, it's minutes worth of an added assessment and, and some people won't make or take that added minute. I, I think it, it needs to be, change that culture or, and, and just to add something to your habit of, an, of assessing a, a patient. The other side of that, um, is implementation of a medication strategy. And and that requires a, a little more uh, a little more effort uh, on our part to change the attitude of a practitioner that's been giving a, a drug or two or or has a has a a very good reason to treat patients with a, a benzodiazepine to calm them preoperatively or or on, on the onset of, of a potentially dangerous behavior to use that same drug uh, uh, midazolam. To in the hopes to calm that behavior, when in fact the research bears out that it's that same drug that traps that patient in in that event, in that episode, in that nightmare, in that flashback, and and now you've limited your options. You've potentially escalated the behavior from maybe nonviolent, hysterical, to violent and thrashing. You know where there's a greater uh, potential for self harm or staff harm. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of, of culture and, and doing a little bit of research, a little bit of reading and saying, you know, maybe we try something new, uh, rather than something old that I've been doing for 10, 15, 20 years.